I think you guys have shown a lot of resilience over the last hour in sitting nice and still. So let's just all get up for a couple of seconds. Just stand up. And I'd like you to take a really deep breath. And I want to make sure the person next to you can hear you. Take a deep breath. Once again. Please sit down. It's two purposes. Number one, I'm your savior because I'm sure your legs were hurting by now. And secondly, it helped me to connect with you. Breathing is important. It makes us feel good. So over the next couple of minutes, I'd like to take you on a journey. And I want to talk about disruption and happiness. I can see some faces that look at me and say, what is this guy going to say about disruption and happiness? How is he going to connect those together? But please bear with me as I get you through this little journey, or maybe rather a short flight. But I'm going to start with a little story. It's a similar story you heard earlier. Because you don't have to be worried, I did not end up in a hospital, and I did not end up in a hospital gown. But a couple of years ago, I was heading an age organization that went across about 30 countries. And one morning I got up, as usual, got my phone, looked at my messages, 55 messages, sort of overwhelming. Just looked through them, went over to my agenda, looked at what I had to do today, what was on my agenda tomorrow, next week. Moved over to my to-do list. Oh, what did I forget to do yesterday? What jumped into today, what I had to do in the afternoon, what I had to do next week. It's all a little overwhelming. I got up, as usual, on autopilot. I showered, I shaved, had a coffee, said goodbye to my wife, went to work. Get to the office, sat down, and just all of a sudden felt this, this emptiness. And I was sitting there, and I just didn't know anymore what I had to do. It was just empty. I didn't know what to focus on, didn't know where to start. And I was experiencing the physiological effects of an emotion. An emotion of being overwhelmed, maybe a certain anxiety to a degree. And I just didn't know anymore what to do. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels like this. Many people feel like this often. Some people feel like this every day. So if we're talking about disruption, how could we possibly welcome disruption within such a mindset? We're living in a busy world. And the American military has actually coined a word for that. They call it the VUCA world. It stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And that's the kind of world we're living in these days. It's a world that is characterized by globalization, by an accelerated pace of change, increased competition, technological advances. It's a very, very busy world. And you sort of ask yourself, but how do organizations survive in that environment? Can they adapt? Can they survive? And what do leaders do? How do they show up when they work for those organizations? And all of us as individuals, how do we live in this VUCA world? I'm sure many of you have heard of those organizations who missed the signs of time. Organizations that were still producing books while digital readers were on the market. Organizations that were still producing photo cameras when photography was going digital. These organizations that are characterized often by either a lack of strategy or maybe strong hierarchies, bureaucracies, lack of interdepartmental collaboration. Let's call them the non-learning organizations. It's not a particularly nice term, but they're truly organizations that don't learn. Or let me say they used to be organizations that didn't learn, because most of them do not exist anymore. On the other hand, the VUCA world also resulted in a new concept of organizations. They're the ones we call the learning organizations. These are the organizations that Peter Senge at the time, with his book, The Fifth Discipline, made popular, or some of the other writers, like Pedler et al. And these organizations that are characterized by strong leadership, by flat organizational structures, and by a drive to bring 
more flexible working practices into the workplace, and innovation. Now we're in a hotel school here. I'm a hotelier, believe it or not. Do we have learning organizations in our industry? An industry that's still very traditional and is definitely characterized by fairly traditional working practices. I'm not going to answer this question here. I think that will give us enough material for an entire TEDx afternoon. But again, learning organizations are the organizations of the future. So what does that mean for leaders? What are the kind of skills and abilities and knowledge that leaders need these days? How do they, should they show up when they work for those organizations? A lot of leaders can be very successful in learning organizations, but many leaders might actually inhibit learning in an organization. So what is it that makes them successful? In my current role, I still travel a lot, spend a lot of time in the air. And the other day I was at Zurich Airport, for those of you who travel a lot as well, as you go over to Terminal E, you have to go down the escalator, you go to passport control. And as I'm on the escalator, I look up and there's this huge poster there. And on the poster it said, skill set or mindset? Oh, that's an amazing question, because that's really what we have to ask ourselves these days. So in my own research on leadership in learning organizations, my findings were very consistent with that. Because what made leaders successful in learning organizations wasn't really the skills they possessed or the leadership styles they applied, but it was about their mindsets. What were the mindsets they brought to work every day? And when I say mindsets, mindsets is all about how do they experience change? How do they create an environment where their colleagues can actually try out new things? Where colleagues can feel safe, there's trust, they can try out new things, they can speak up, they can challenge the status quo. Over the past years, many organizations tried to bring in more innovation into their processes, into their organization. And one of those processes, which you may know, is design thinking. Design thinking is really a creative problem-solving process that starts with empathy, make sure we listen to people, we don't always do this in our industry, then define the problem, make sure you brainstorm to come up with solutions, and then very quickly go and prototype those ideas before you go and test them. These kind of innovation processes, they need a very different mindset from leaders. Already starting with empathy, the ability to actually listen to other people, feel with them, and then define what the problem is and then brainstorm. Having a team that actually really thrives on speaking out, throwing out ideas without fear of being judged. And then most importantly, take all those great ideas and start prototyping them. And prototyping means not being afraid of failure. Prototype as many ideas as you want. Low resolution, 0.5 version, whatever you want to call them. But we have to have the ability to go and prototype them and make sure employees can fail safely and fail early. For those of you who know me, I used to work in hotels for many, many years. So when I was younger, I remember working in a hotel where when I was coming from the back of the house to the front of the house, there was a door into the lobby and there was a big sign on top of the door. And it said, attention, with flashing lights. No, no flashing lights. It just said, attention, you are now entering guest contact areas. Wow. <laughs> they may as well have written, hey Eve, from here onwards, uh, no more mistakes. So you put that mindset towards what we need to do today. Let our colleagues to try out new ideas. Let them fail. Let them do things differently. So how can we foster those mindsets? We're all living in a very busy world. We live in a VUCA world, remember? Volatile. And in this VUCA world, sometimes it's difficult to adjust. We're connected 24-7, we're constantly on, and it's very, very difficult to find emotional balance. 
It's a world where there's data everywhere. There's much more distraction around there, which makes it very, very difficult to focus. It's stressing, it's overwhelming. In addition, we spend a large amount of time, where we're literally disconnected, we're on autopilot, we're not in the present. And these during times we should be engaging with other people. Research has shown that we spend 47% of our time on autopilot, not being present. And when I say 47% of our time, I mean awake time. This is not when we're sleeping. So half of our day, we're on autopilot. And it's during that time, we're seriously compromising our ability to be our best. When I say our best, that also means the ability to embrace change and to welcome disruption. So what can we do? What kind of techniques can we put into place to actually get out of this VUCA world? People get sucked into this VUCA world. People don't know how to keep their heads above water. They're constantly on and they don't know how to get out of it. They don't know how to create distance between emotions and what they have to do. An emotion, you can't stop it. An emotion is physiological. But an emotion only lasts a couple of minutes. Everything else is our mind feeding the emotion. So how can we create that distance? Professor Richard Davidson from the University of Wisconsin Center for Healthy Mind argued that well-being is a skill. And it's a skill that can be taught or that can be learned. The same way you can learn how to play an instrument or you can learn how to play a sport. He bases his research on the concept of neuroplasticity, something you heard earlier on from Alexandra as well. And neuroplasticity, in easy words, from a non-academic like me, means that our brains are malleable. Our brains can actually change physically, structurally, through exercise. So his framework of well-being, he talks about focused attention, positive outlook, generosity and compassion, and resilience. And if you put this in the context of disruption and change, resilience is an amazing skill to have. Remember, we talked about the design thinking process. Fail early, fail often. That's a hard thing. You're telling somebody, I want you to go and fail. We all want to achieve something. But people who have resilience, they actually get it. They can go, they can try it out. They fall on the floor, they get up again. And that's what resilience does. So Richard Davidson says you can train those skills. And he says those skills should really become part of what you do every day. Interesting, he also said, a hundred years ago, nobody was brushing their teeth, right? As if we would all know. <laughs> but we all gained the insight over the years that, you know what, brushing teeth is actually good for me. So I'm going to teach my kids to do this every morning, and I'm going to start doing it every morning. But the argument of Richard Davidson is one day people will also gain the insight that mental training or mindfulness training is important and is good for you, and that this mental hygiene, as he calls it, is going to become part of your day-to-day -day life. I'd like to do a very small practice with you. That's my little gift to you. You can stay seated, it doesn't hurt, it will only take you 15 seconds. And his practice is called the three breath. And yes, it's as simple as three breath. What I'd like you to do is when you breathe in for the first time, try to feel your breath. As you breathe in, breathe in through your nostrils, as the air goes down your lungs, into your stomach, feel how you're breathing. For some of you, it might be the first time you literally feel your breath. On the second breath, I'd like you to relax. And on the third breath, I'd like you to ask yourself the question, what is important right now? Okay? Everybody with me? So first breath, feel your breath. Second breath, relax. And your third breath, what is important right now?
Did you feel the shift? This is a very small micro practice that at any given time you feel overwhelmed or you feel I can't get out of an emotion. Within 15 seconds, it gets you right into the place where you need to be. If I had known that a couple of years ago, I would have done that in the morning when I came to the office. It still is a great practice to do in the morning. It's a great practice if you have a busy day and somebody comes to meet you. And if you truly want to spend quality time with the person, take three breaths. Gets you right into the moment, spend time with that person. Or if you have a difficult conversation with somebody. Or when you go home in the evening. When you go home in the evening, three breaths. What is important right now? It's important to spend time with the family. So three breaths is a great way to get you out of wherever you are at any given time. So the insight I gained over the past year or so was we all live in a VUCA world. And this won't change. We will always live in a VUCA world. It will always be volatile. It will always be uncertain. It will always be complex and ambiguous. Organizations have to learn how to operate under those circumstances. They have to become learning organizations. They have to be able to adapt. Leaders have to start showing up differently at work. They have to adopt the kind of mindsets you need these days to foster organizational learning every day. And individuals to survive in the VUCA world uh, have to adopt practices that help them in managing their minds, in moving forward. So mindfulness practices, they help you to create that awareness, that clarity, that help you foster real skills uh, that help you with life. Mindfulness practices create that clarity. And mindfulness practices also help you to foster emotional intelligence in the areas of self-awareness, self-management, empathy, compassion, social skills, leadership. And those kind of skills uh, don't only give you the ability to embrace change and actually welcome disruption, but they also make you a better leader. They also make you a better person. And as Mathieu Ricard would say, they also create the condition for your own happiness. I'm very grateful to be here. I'd like to thank you for giving me the gift of time and listen to me. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Vielen Dank.